Okay, so we're going to hop into, I'll call it topic four, just assuming that Mr. Harrison kind of did three lessons beforehand. So our topic today is on talking a bit about solutions and a word that we're going to introduce. It's called dissociation. I'll get to dissociation in a little while, but that's kind of our main issue here. So um, my first set of notes here, we use a lot of chemicals that get dissolved in water. Water is just such a plentiful and available resource that we often make things, like my Gatorade here, that have water in them. And I've got three just generic examples here of things that are that are water-based. Right? right off the bat, you've got syrup. Right? Now, when you think of syrup, is syrup like my Gatorade? What's the big difference between the two? It's much more... What, what did you say? Yeah, like it's it's thicker, right? It's not nearly as maybe like as runny, right? But at the end of the day, like there is kind of a watery component to it. What What's probably like inside the syrup that there's so much of that makes it so thick. Like what's the what's the ingredient inside of it? Yeah, right? It is so full of sugar that it just it thickens it right up, right? But that's an example of a solution. Now pop is also an example of a solution, and in, and in more than one ways, because there is water in pop, obviously, right? There's a liquid component. There's sugar. But that's actually not one of the bigger components. Does anybody know what the larger component other than the water is in pop? Yeah, carbonated. It's actually carbon dioxide. You guys heard that term before, carbon dioxide, right? You can actually literally hear the carbon dioxide escaping from the pop when you open it and you go, shh, right? Because all of that carbonation inside is slowly but surely escaping, right? And you guys have probably left a pop out on the counter for a while and you drink it and it doesn't taste very good. Sometimes you say the pop is really flat, right? Because eventually the solution has lost all its carbonation, right? So that's another example. And the third one here would be just like anything that's like a household cleaner, right? So like you go use some bleach or you use like some ammonia or, or you know, like pine salt, right? Very liquid-based things, but there's stuff dissolved inside. And that's the word I want to use here, dissolved, where one thing is inside of another. It's not a pure substance. There's more than one thing happening. And I've got a really basic picture to kind of like illustrate the concept here for, for the words I want you to know. When you want to make a solution, there really there's two things. There is something called a solvent, something called a solute. And you guys might have heard these words before because I think it's in grade eight or nine maybe. So uh, the solvent is usually water. But here's the more important thing I need you to know. The solvent is what there is the most of. Okay? Whether it's water or solid or liquid or gas, whatever you have the most of, that is the solvent. And the solute is what you put inside of it. And so if I wanted to make juice, you guys know how you make like juice with like just little crystals, right? Like Kool-Aid, put a couple scoops in, stir it up, right? The solute would be like the solid crystals you put inside. The solvent would be the water, mix them together, stir them up. And uh, we sometimes use another word for it, we call them mixtures, but mixtures implies a lot of different things. Let me give you another example of a mixture. Do you guys know what like um, checks mix is where you have like, um, or trail mix, there's a better one. You guys know what trail mix is? You get like peanuts and raisins and maybe some M&Ms and some pecans and, you know, that's a mixture as well, but we wouldn't call that a solution. And the reason we don't call this is a solution is because it needs to look the same. Okay. If you can literally see the differences and go, well, there's one of those and one of those and one of those, it's not a solution. Pudding would be a great example of a solution though, right? Clearly inside pudding, you've got some milk and you've got your chocolate stuff you put inside, right? And you mix it all together. Can you see the differences anymore? No. Okay. So that's the really big thing here. The word we use is homogeneous. And um, homo means the same. Right? So if you have things that look the same, it's homogeneous. Anyways, let me move on to my next slide here. That's what I basically was just describing uh, over the last little bit here is some of these words. So it probably wouldn't hurt for you guys to highlight a couple of these. I'm fairly certain they're actually some of the questions on your assignment, is to make sure you know the terminology we're talking about. So let me just read them off again. The solvent is the stuff that other things get dissolved in. Okay, it's the larger section. Nine times out of ten, it's water. It doesn't have to be. The solute is what you put inside of it. And then the other words I have down here is a pure substance. Now, when we talk about solutions, though, Solutions are not pure substances. Because for it to be pure, there has to be literally just one thing. Is my Gatorade just one thing? 
Well, no, I mean, look at the ingredient list, right? There was water, sugar, okay. Even if I just stop there, as soon as I say two things, it can't be a pure substance anymore. Right? If it was just water, or just sugar, or just citric acid salt, modified cornstarch, if, if it was just one of those, it's pure. Is that clear to you guys? Okay. So then that means it has to be a mixture, and of the two mixtures, there's hetero and homogeneous. And basically, if it looks the same, it can be a solution. So I covered that pretty good. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, basically, yeah. So like, this would be like um, trail mix. If you want to write that down. This would be like trail mix, whereas this would be like, I don't know, pudding to me is a good example. I know there's more than one thing inside the pudding. However, let's say I put gummy worms in inside the pudding. You guys ever had that before? But like gummy worms inside pudding? Oh, it's delicious. And like some broken up like Oreos or breadcrumbs. Anyways, okay, if you could have that inside the pudding, then it wouldn't be a solution anymore. It wouldn't be homogeneous because then you have different things you can see. So, okay, I believe my next slide is just kind of a, a picture of like what this would look like, but I feel like you guys get the sense of how this works. So I'm going to move on if that's okay. This slide right here, though, I want to talk about some exceptions. I've already said nine times out of ten, if we're talking about solutions in this unit, we're probably talking about water, but it doesn't have to be. And I know I have questions about this on your quizzes. Okay. So make sure you maybe put a little star next to this. You can have a solution with any phase of matter. You guys know the phases of matter being solid, liquid, and gas. I've got some examples on here. I'll just walk you through them. You can have a solution of gas and gas. Air is that example. Most of the air you breathe is nitrogen. And inside the nitrogen is oxygen. Now, as I look at this air right here, do you guys see that that one's oxygen, that one's nitrogen? Can you see the differences? It's a solution then, right? It all looks the same. But there is more than one thing that you're breathing in. Most of it's nitrogen, but there's oxygen, carbon dioxide, methane. Right? So, uh, another example, gas inside liquid. Um, you might not really notice this unless there's bubbles. But you guys ever see like your water and see how like there's a little bit of bubbling inside of it? Sometimes you get uh, oxygenated water where a little bit of oxygen gets dissolved inside. That can happen. Um, maybe you actually have um, some ice and uh, that water then freezes. Sometimes you can actually even see like the air bubbles inside an ice cube. Okay. Now, that probably wouldn't be considered a solution anymore if you can see the differences. But I think that illustrates the idea that you know that it can exist. And so if the air bubbles can exist where you see them, there must be some examples where you just you can't see them, and it's like really uniform and smooth. Um, this one right here is one that um, maybe you guys are familiar with. Do you guys know what antifreeze is? Or do you guys know what it's used for? Where do you put antifreeze? Yeah, and the reason why is that antifreeze, as its words literally describe, is supposed to not freeze. We need to use it in Canada a lot because we get like minus ridiculous temperatures, right? Minus 40 temperatures. And there are certain parts of your car that you just don't want to have freeze, right? And so what they do is they take methanol and they dissolve it in water. You guys know what point water freezes at, right? Zero, yeah. But methanol has a much lower freezing point than that. So mix them together, and antifreeze doesn't freeze at, until it's like minus 50 or 60 or something like that out there, right? And so that's all it takes is just a little bit of a combination of the two. You should never drink uh, antifreeze, by the way. It's horrible. Um, I already talked about syrup, the idea of like sugar in water. Uh, let's talk about this one for a bit. It's the, the term is called an alloy. Um, bronze is a good example. And steel is another one where what they do is they take two metals and they like they superheat them to the point where the metal is literally a liquid. So we're talking like thousands of degrees Celsius, right? And then you pour liquid metal one and liquid metal two together, stir them all up. And then maybe you'd put it into like a mold and make like a sword or, I don't know, whatever it is out of it. Does that make sense? And so um, humans have known about how to do this for a long time. A bit of a side note, um, science has always been really at the forefront of war, unfortunately. You guys ever heard of the Bronze Age? Basically the idea is, well, before the Bronze Age, if you and I were fighting, I might have a stick or a bow and arrow, and you might be throwing a rock. But like, as soon as someone figured out how to melt a couple of metals together and make a sword, that changed everything, right? Because who wins between a stick and a sword? Duh, right? And so the idea of being able to make a stronger metal is really important. Now, like, if I have a sword 
and you have a sword, but mine is even stronger than yours because mine is now made out of steel, and steel is better than bronze, well, then my technology trumps yours, right? And really, in terms of human history, I mean, it basically went from throwing rocks to maybe bows and arrows to sticks to swords to armor to eventually the point where we now have guns and now, like, nuclear weapons, and it just it keeps escalating. But I kind of got off on a sidetrack here, but anyways, alloys are basically where you melt different metals together, and they're much stronger because of it. So the most common two you guys all know of are bronze. We don't use bronze a lot anymore, though. Steel is really the big one. We use steel in a lot of different things because it's very strong. I believe steel is carbon mixed with iron. And on their own, iron is not bad. Um, carbon is actually not that strong at all. Do you guys know where we use carbon a lot? We're writing with it. Yeah. Yeah. Pencil lead is actually not made of lead, by the way. It used to be. And then we discovered lead is toxic and poisonous and decided to ixnay that. So when you guys use pencil lead, we still call it lead as a throwback, but it's actually carbon. W would you make a sword out of pencil lead and expect to win? <laughs> Heck no. <laughs> no. And iron rusts a lot which is why it's very weak. But, ironically, put the two of them together, melt them together into an alloy, a solution, and, uh, yeah, you can make a stainless steel sword. It's pretty pretty strong. Oh, yeah, anyways, I'm spending way too much time on this. Here's something else I need you guys to know. Sometimes what we're going to do is, after we write a chemical compound, we're going to put little brackets afterwards. Now, you've probably seen this before. If I were to write H2O, you probably would put a little L next to it. Does anybody know what the L stands for? And if I were to give you NaCl with an S, that would mean solid. If I were to give you H2 with a G, that means gas. It tells you what state of matter it is. Well, if you ever see one of these little abbreviations afterwards, it tells you what it's been dissolved in. So if it's dissolved in ALC, alcohol. Okay. I mean, not drinking alcohol. Okay. That's different. Um, AQ is the one I want to focus on. AQ means aqueous, A-Q, oh, I didn't spell that right, hang on, A-Q-U-E-O-U-S, means aqueous, and, uh, I mean, you guys ever heard the root word, like, aqua? Aqua kind of refers to, like, water, so if you ever see aqueous, it means that you're dissolving something in water. So, as, as vocabulary, and by the way, like, most of what I'm doing today is just teaching you vocabulary. This would be considered an aqueous solution because most of it is water. Does that make sense? Would his water bottle with the water inside that be considered an aqueous solution? Though? The answer is no because it's not actually a solution. It's just water. So we would just write H2O with an L next to it. Can I say that one more time? This, I would write it with an AQ afterwards because it is mostly water, but there's other stuff inside. But if you ever just had pure water, you wouldn't write AQ next to it because the AQ just means that it's dissolved inside water. So, for example, if I were to write this sugar with a little AQ, what that means is that the sugar is dissolved in water. Okay? And like I said, nine times out of ten, it's water. I can hardly think of any examples I've ever done, even with my chemistry class, where we use alcohol. The only one that I know of that's common is uh, formaldehyde. I think Lav has a few jars in his classroom. Formaldehyde is something they use sometimes to keep body tissue from um, rotting. And um, what you might see is like a, a like a fetus of like a pig or something like that inside a jar. You ever seen something like that where you put like a like an animal inside that? And so sometimes we use formaldehyde inside like a sealed container to like keep it staying. So you might see that, but like it, it, it's almost always water. Oh yeah, let's move on. Wait, now, another term I want you guys to know is the term electrolyte. Now, you've probably heard this before, because actually Gatorade markets itself by saying, replenish your electrolytes. Have you ever heard that phrase before? Like, athletes are told this all the time, replenish electrolytes. Well, what does that mean? Okay. Well, I want to talk, before I talk about what it means, I want to talk about where the word came from. Electrolyte refers to the fact that it can conduct electricity. That's actually where the word came from. Electrolytes, I'll even write that down. Actually, you can see that here. They conduct electrical current, electricity. Okay. We're going to do a lab on this on Thursday, so I'm not going to go grab the stuff for it yet because we're actually going to we're going to do this. But the basic idea is that if it conducts electricity, it is then an electrolyte. Okay. So I've got a couple of pictures here that kind of describe it. 
here there's like a setup here where the brown wire goes to here. There's this little rod that goes in the water. This one comes out of the water and it goes through. And I know your guys' is in black and white. Can you guys see on my screen? Here the light bulb's not on. This one then would be a non-electrolyte. It does not conduct electricity. But these ones right here, they do conduct electricity. This one right here is kind of weak at it, but the light bulb went on a little bit. And uh, this one right here is actually quite strong. Right? So that's where the word electrolyte came from. Now we should go talk about, well, why, why does it conduct electricity? Okay. The reason why is that something that conducts electricity has to make a continuous loop. You guys know how like when you plug something into the wall, it turns on, right? But if you unplugged it from the wall, duh, it stops working, right? It's because you have to have a continuous circuit. In order for something to conduct, electricity has to go like from here, through the light bulb, through here, down through here, and it has to find a way for electrons, electricity, to kind of bridge that gap and then keep going. Well, in order to bridge that gap, you have to have something known as ions inside there. There has to be dissolved bits inside. Pure water doesn't actually have that ability. But can you guys see in this little one right here how there's some positive and negative little bits sitting inside there? If there's some stuff inside that can move, it actually can have the ability to conduct. And that brings me back to my Gatorade. Is this Gatorade pure water? No, I already read a million ingredients off to the side. Because you know one of the reasons why it conducts electricity is there's a lot of dissolved stuff inside here. And that dissolved stuff can actually move in between and cause electrical current to go there. And so that's actually why we call it an electrolyte. So the fact that it conducts, by the way, has nothing to do with why you drink it for replenishing your, your for your like after sports. But that's why we call it that. Okay, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about dissolving. Okay. You guys have all seen this before at some point in your life, I'm sure. You go get some juice crystals from the Kool-Aid container. The juice crystals are solid, right? You then take them, you dump them in the water, and you stir it up, and the crystals are gone. But are they really gone? No. What really happened is they were dissolved. Okay. And you probably know this word, but I want to imagine that you could get on the magic school bus and you could like zoom down into like microscopic size. This picture here is the best one I've ever seen to kind of describe what's happening. When you put those solid juice crystals in, it would look something like this. And for the sake of simplicity, let's just use sodium chloride, salt. Okay. Salt is NaCl. But it's actually not just one of each. There's like an Na, then a Cl, then an NaCl. And this would be like a, a little block of salt. And what ends up happening is water is literally able to rip it apart into pieces. Um, I, I give an analogy of uh, when I went to the uh, Super Bowl or when I went to Gillette Stadium for a Patriots game. I want to sit next to my family. However, if there are 70,000 people there and I accidentally end up getting separated from like my brother that I'm traveling with, can you kind of understand how like a huge number of people could cause me to somehow get lost a little bit from the person I'm next to? It's kind of like that here. There are so many water molecules right here that literally what happens is it rips it apart. This guy right here used to be attached to the main solid structure over here, but there's so much water that they literally, they get ripped apart. And the phrase we use here is that the lattice breaks down. Lattice, by the way, refers to this sort of shape here, where there's like a nice little solid chunk. Now, like even when you guys think of like a single grain of like um, Kool-Aid crystals, I'm not even talking that small. I'm talking way smaller than that, right? Like if you could zoom in on just one grain of salt, that grain of salt is still made up of tons and tons of atoms inside there. <laughs> And so really what's happening when dissolving happens is the water just tears it to shreds. Okay. I have another silly example I use with the Chem 20, so you guys might appreciate this one. If you had to, not that I'm advocating this by any means, <laughs> but if you had to get in a fight with a first grader, would you win? Probably. But if you had to get in a fight with a million first graders, do you still think you would win? And this, the sheer amount of them would just overwhelm you. Does that make sense? And so, like, imagine these two guys right here. They're going to go back to back, and they're like Neo in the Matrix, just, like, hitting everybody away. You guys seen the Matrix before? Or is that too dated, right? They're going back to back, and they're taking guys out left and right. But, like, if there was literally a million people, you two would get separated at some point. You get what I'm saying there? 
And that's really what's happening here, is that this sodium and this chloride, they want to be buddy-buddy, but at some point, they are apart from each other. And because of that, it almost looks like it disappears. The solid looks like it's gone, but it's not. It's in what's known as its ion format, where it's been dissolved. So you guys know this concept. I'm sure you do, because you've seen this before. What I'm just trying to do today is, is try to like put vocabulary to the concept. Okay. So Now, here's maybe the point I need to get back to here. This gave a reason for why ionic things can conduct. Okay? Because this should conduct electricity according to the idea of an electrolyte. But the question is why? Why does it conduct electricity? Loud out there. The reason why is that you I should maybe pause for a second. Do you guys know what electricity really is? What 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 is electricity? It's a whole bunch of electrons. When electrons flow, you have electricity. Okay? Basically you need to have charged particles moving. Hey. Yeah, yeah, whatever you need. Whenever you have charged particles moving, that's electricity. Well, in order for things to conduct electricity, you need to have charged particles. Can you guys see how there's a Cl minus up here in the corner? That's a charged particle. It can now help conduct electricity. This Na plus up in the corner, it's also a charged particle. It can conduct electricity. When Na and Cl merge together, go a little bit more that way because you can't see me. Um, when Na and Cl merge together, it's no longer charged anymore but rip them apart, and one's positive, one's negative. Makes sense. So if you were to have NaCl, salt, just sitting in the water in its undissolved format, it wouldn't conduct electricity. But when water literally rips it apart, you know, like a really bad breakup, boyfriend goes here, girlfriend goes this way, right? A plus and a minus. Well, now there's the ability to conduct. Does that logic make sense? So let me move forward. I'm taking a little longer than I want. So basically, here's kind of the picture again, one more time to kind of illustrate the idea. Imagine you take some salt, and you want to put the salt inside the water. Why does the salt disappear? Because it literally got ripped into pieces. This is the sodium, this is the chlorine. Here's the sodium, here's the chlorine. They used to be literally tied at the hip. They used to be like stuck together. Here's Na, here's Cl as a compound, and now they've been ripped apart into ions. Um, Harrison did a pretty good job of explaining this. Do you guys remember the difference between an atom and an ion? Atoms have no charge. They're neutral. Protons and electrons are the same. But eventually if it breaks things up into ions, ions don't have the same number of protons and electrons. So if sodium has a plus charge, let's do a little quick thought experiment here. If sodium has a plus charge, are there more protons or electrons? Sodium has a plus charge. Are there more protons or electrons? Protons. If chlorine has a minus charge, are there more protons or electrons? Electrons, yeah. Because really what's happened is sodium would have lost an electron and chlorine would have taken it. And that's why chlorine has an extra one and sodium is kind of missing one. And because of that, this stuff cannot conduct electricity. Um, let's move forward here. What else do we got? So I guess I've just got more pictures kind of describing the exact same thing. The idea that like here is this like positive, negative, positive, negative. This would be sodium and chlorine, as an example, stuck together. But just like my example with like a million first graders, if there's that much water nearby, it literally will just start grabbing you and just start ripping you apart. Right? That's, that's dissolving. So I think it would be really cool if we could actually like be on the magic school bus and watch this happening. But Do you guys get a pretty good mental image of what I'm going for? Awesome. Moving on. Okay. Here's two more words I want you guys to know. Um, the words are miscible and immiscible. And I, I always struggle with knowing whether to say the C in the word. So if you just call it miscible and immiscible, but I think, I think you're supposed to say the C. I think it's supposed to be immiscible. You guys probably know this concept too. These are things that either mix or don't mix. The common example is oil and water. You guys ever seen before where like there's like a layer level of water and then you put some oil on top and it just does not dissolve. It gets into layers. Classic example, Italian salad dressing. You guys ever seen that before? Even salad dressing in general is a good example, right? Where you can literally see two layers separating. 
right? In that case, that's not a solution because it's not dissolved. Now, when we do use salad dressing, usually you got to shake it up first before you use it, right? Just to like mix it back together. But those are more words we would use. Is these are things that do dissolve, and these are things that don't dissolve. Another place you might have seen this before. Um, if you ever go boating, and uh, you need to like refill your gas tank with um, gas, right? And maybe you spill a little bit of like boat gas or boat oil on the surface of the water. Not that you'd want to, but you can literally like kind of see the sheen of the gas on the water. Anyone ever seen this before? You know what I'm talking about? Because literally it does not mix, right? It's actually one of the biggest reasons why um, it is a huge problem when there's oil spills in water is that the oil does not just like mix into the water and just kind of dissolve away. It doesn't have that ability. If I were to dump like a whole bunch of sugar or salt into the ocean, not really a big deal. The water will just literally rip it apart. Not a big deal. But oil, it can't do that too. So the oil literally just sits on the surface and eventually the oil will destroy birds, fish, plants. You get what I mean? All right, moving on. Okay, so now that we've talked a lot about solutions, I want to talk about three key characteristics in order to make a solution. Okay, here's the three things that affect how well you can make a solution. The first one is agitation. Again, this is a huge vocabulary day. Hey? Does anybody know what an agitation means in science? Not as like a you know, bugging your friend or something like that, because that's a different type of agitation. Right? <laughs> anybody know what it means? Imagine that you're making Kool-Aid. You take your spoon, you put it in there. What else do you have to do in order to make a Kool-Aid? Mix it. Agitation is the chemistry science word for mixing or stirring, if you want to write that down. Stir. So if you can stir or mix something, doesn't that make things dissolve faster? Now, the second one on this list, I think you guys actually know about as well. Let's say you want to make coffee or tea. Coffee and tea are both solutions as well, where you're dissolving something inside water. Right? You're dissolving part of the coffee grinds or part of the tea leaves inside your water. Now, although we enjoy drinking our coffee hot, because that just tastes better, right? let's say you want to make your coffee. Do you dissolve the, the, the coffee in cold water and then heat it up? Or do you boil the water and then put the coffee in? That's the second one, right? And the reason why is that a higher temperature makes it easier for things to dissolve, right? Hot things dissolve faster than slow than cold things. Let's talk about why. If again, if you could hop on the magic school bus, what's the difference between something that's hot and cold? What's happening with the molecules that are things that are hot? Yeah, they move faster, right? Because you guys have heard this before, right? Like all the molecules, they're bumping around into each other, right? If it's cold, they're just bump, right? But if it's hot, they're, they're just colliding more, right? Doesn't it make logical sense that hot things that have way more bumping into each other collisions, and therefore it's going to dissolve them, right? And we do this with our food a lot. I mean, yes, we also like to eat hot food, but if you wanted to make tea, the best way to make even iced tea would be to heat up the water, pour the crystals in, dissolve it, and then cool it back down again. Because they'll dissolve much faster at a high temperature. Okay, and then the last one is surface area. Um, in terms of this one here, maybe the best way I can describe this is your stomach. Your stomach is eventually going to dissolve the food you eat. right? And um, there's a couple different mechanisms by which the nutrients from your food eventually get into your body. One, you guys have probably heard there's like acid in your stomach, right? And so that is one thing that will help dissolve the food that you eat, right? I mean, obviously, when you eat, you know, some food, it comes out you the other end, right? Um, it doesn't come out in the exact same format, right? Obviously, it's been broken down and processed a little bit. So to get it to the processed bit, we have to dissolve it. Does that make sense? But here's another mechanism that we have. Rather than just our stomach acid, before the food goes down our, our like, esophagus, what else do we do to it? We have to chew it, right? And by chewing it, we give it more surface area. Does that make sense? And so if you were to imagine the same sort of thing, imagine that I wanted you to make a solution with sugar. You guys know like sugar cubes? How they come in like in a little cube like that? If I took that sugar cube and plopped it in there, or if I took the sugar cube, I 
ground it all up and then put the ground up sugar in there, which one would dissolve faster? The one that's all ground up. Does that make sense? And the reason why is that there's more exposed area to it. Right? If you can kind of imagine a picture here, these guys right here, you can even see these Alka-Seltzer tablets. You can literally watch them dissolving as like these little pieces are like being broken off of it, right? But it's gonna take a little while for it to dissolve. If I crushed it all up into a little powder first and put the powder in, wouldn't that be much more effective? So those are your three factors. Stirring it makes it dissolve better. Heating it up makes it dissolve better. And, and like crushing it into pieces also makes it dissolve better. In terms of medication even, you guys might even recognize this. Um, you guys heard of like liquid gel tablets for like say Advil? Because the idea behind Advil being a liquid gel is that as soon as that plastic coating on the outside gets dissolved away by your stomach acid, hopefully immediately the effects of the Advil can start getting into your body and your bloodstream, right? But if you take one of those like harder tablet type things and you're not allowed to chew it, imagine you still have to swallow it, right? It takes a little while for your stomach acid to eventually like eat it away and corrode at it. And so, yeah, that's why surface area is so important too. Okay. Last thing we gotta talk about, we gotta talk about some chemical equations. So now that we've talked about a lot of the theory behind this, a lot of terminology, the one thing we're going to do today is learn a chemical equation. Okay. It's called dissociation. And this is literally the easiest equation I could give you. The way dissociation works is you start with something that was a compound. Again, imagine like a, a boyfriend and girlfriend combo here. So here's the boy, here's the girl, and they are together for all purposes. A plus and a minus, they're now a compound. Well, what does dissociation do? Breaks them up. So like literally, that's what I've got in this example right Here's NaCl. It was in compound form, and what ended up happening is now you have positive sodiums and negative fluorines. Now, a few things I want to point out here in this equation. You have to give credit AQ to water, because imagine I just put some salt on the table. Would that salt all of a sudden just start dissociating and breaking it? No, because what does it take? It takes a whole crap load of water to literally rip them apart, right? So it's very important that you put these little subscripts here for AQ, letting you know that the water was what was part of it. But I've also got that note right here. The formula for the solvent water is not needed, so we don't need to say that like this was added to water, because really water just helped rip them apart. It's, it's credit that's given right here. So these are actually pretty easy to write and work with. I've got some examples on the next slide here. Like here's one, here's KCL. See how KCl has been broken up into K plus and Cl minus? Always one positive and one negative. But the next two, I've got to talk about a few more things to them. See how there's Al2SO43. While we're here, we should do a little bit of a review. I know Harrison did a little bit of Al is aluminum. Does anybody know aluminum? Well, it's obvious, I guess. Aluminum is charged with 3 plus. And SO4 is one of those polyatomic ones, which is a 2 minus. So that's where these things are. Okay, so we'll grab them. trying to make this compound. You guys can see that doesn't really fit. Okay. So then what we need to do is have another 2 minus. But now I'm going to put in 4 minus SO3 plus. There it is. Plus. Very bad. And that still doesn't fit, so I need one more. Kind of explains why this formula right here is so convoluted. Because for the aluminum, we need two of them. You guys see how this was supposed to be the aluminum? There's one of two of them. And then for this SO4 bit right here, I need three of them because three at two minus makes it fit. Okay. Well, now what I'm talking about doing is rather than having this be one thing, and this is where your like boyfriend girlfriend analogy kind of breaks. 
breaks up because the capacitor is one to one. Here, all of these are together, and then water comes around and does not together. Get the idea? And so when you're done, when you're done, what you end up having is five different particles. There were two aluminum particles somewhere on the floor here. I won't find them, right? And there are three SO4 particles. And that's what these numbers right here refer to, is that you used to have one big, like, conglomerate, and then as water ripped them apart, you actually now have five smaller pieces. I also have an analogy for this. I have analogies for everything in chemistry. My daughter loves playing with Lego. And so imagine that Kinsey's playing with Lego, and she's just making a really basic car or something like that. And all of the Lego blocks are all stuck together. I would argue that she has one car. Then my three-year-old comes along, finds her car, and decides to yeah, and break it into pieces, right? Now, there once was one car, but after she gets broken up into smaller pieces, now there's more smaller pieces. I used to have one molecule, and now there are collectively two plus three. There's now five pieces left over. But what's the size of these pieces? This was rather big, and these guys right here are now small. In the same way for Lego, one big Lego car has now been broken up into a whole bunch of smaller little bricks. You get that analogy there? So the really important thing, though, is you have to put the two and the three in front of it. Otherwise, it's not considered balanced. So the same thing happens here. You're going to need to have one copper, and then this nitrate right here, see this two right here? It actually ends up going out front, and you have two of those. So that's called a dissociation equation. I need you guys to be able to recognize them and write them. But honestly, it's very basic. In its general form, it's like A, B turns into A positive and B negative. Or if it's like A, B, 2, it would turn into something like A, 2 positive and 2 B negatives. This 2 kind of ending up over there. Sound good? I think I'm almost done. Do I have more slides? Okay. There is one more thing I should talk about. Remember how there was that miscible and immiscible idea of some things that just don't dissolve? There are some compounds that literally just don't dissolve. And we're going to do this in a lab on Thursday. Um, if that's the case and they don't conduct, remember the whole turn about electrolytes? Electrolytes should break apart into pieces and should conduct. But anything that doesn't do that, for example, imagine I have this water bottle here. Imagine I put a marble inside. Would you expect the marble to break into pieces? Okay. So then it's not an electrolyte. The marble is not part of the solution. If that's the case, then like the equation you would write would literally be like this stuff staying as this stuff inside water. Let's say that one more time. This is what I started with. This is a marble. And this stuff is still a marble, only it's inside water. And so I don't try to break it up into like some positives and some negatives. right? Like if it doesn't conduct, there are some things that don't, then, then you couldn't try to do that. Okay, that's my lesson. How'd it go? Okay. Um, I know you guys don't have this in front of you, but why don't I walk you through what I'd like you to do for the last half hour? Okay, because I know you have some time left. Ideally, I always design my assignments to be done a little at a time. So like one chemistry assignment. So ideally, my assignments then are meant to be like do a little every day. Okay? I really don't want you guys trying to do your assignments like the day before the test. Right? Now, the first couple of questions here are actually really the review stuff that you would have done with Mr. Harrison. So I'll walk you through them kind of quick, but I want to show you what you should really work on today. Uh, this one right here is about atomic molar masses, and it wants to talk about like valence electrons and Bohr and Lewis diagrams. If, if you want, I'll help you with that in a bit, but I don't want to talk about that right now just because that's not what's fresh in our mind. I want to hop down to what would ideally be today's stuff. I want to talk about... This question here, and this question here. Name the following compounds, and determine if the co compound should dissolve in water or not. So let's talk about that. In order for it to dissolve in water, it has to be able to break apart into ions. One of them has to be positive, and the other one have to be negative. Makes sense. So as we look at these compounds right here, we got to figure out, is it possible for there to be a positive and a negative? So let's try the first one if you can see it. NaF. What's the charge of Na? Just plus one. Okay. 
So if this thing is going to be able to dissolve, I'm going to need F to be negative. Is F got a negative charge? Perfect. It's ionic. It should dissolve. If I were to write it out as a formula, I know I didn't ask you to write it out, but it's the association formula for this. NaF as a solid would turn into Na positive in a water formula and an F minus in a water formula. So let's find the next one here. CH4. What's the charge on carbon? It doesn't list one. What's the charge on hydrogen? Positive or negative one. Do you guys remember talking about ionic compounds versus molecular compounds? If they're both on the same side of the staircase line, they're molecular compounds and they share electrons. This guy right here, the second one, CH4, it wouldn't conduct. It doesn't have anything to break up into. It doesn't have a positive and a negative to break up into. So I won't go to the board and write it, but what you would literally do is write CH4 turns into CH4. Like literally nothing would occur. Um, let's do one more. Lithium and oxygen. What's lithium's charge? Li. So you can say it. You're right. It's positive one. I think that's what you said. Anybody know what oxygen's charge is? Is it listed on your table? Negative two? Okay, so you have some positives and some negatives. So what should happen? They should break into pieces. Uh, maybe I will write this one out. I want to make sure you guys get it. So for that third one, you would start with Li2O. Anyone want to take a stab at it? What should I write in this? <laughs> well, okay, so what are the two pieces? One of the pieces is Li, the other one is O. So what's the charge on? There's two lithiums that are oxygen. That two right there. So really, this is one item, and it's now been broken up into three, two of these lithiums. That's the And then the last question, number five here, basically is what we just talked about all class. I want for you guys to try to tell me what dissociation is. I mean, basically, dissociation means you're dissolving stuff. But don't just say that, right? Try to explain to me what is happening. And that's why the second half of this says use a diagram to show me how NaCl would dissociate in water. What I'm really looking for is a picture that looks like maybe this one here or maybe this one here where like all the waters kind of rip it away or maybe even this picture right here. But I want you to don't just say it dissolves. Try to explain to me how it literally rips them apart. What was a nice joined compound all of a sudden breaks apart. Okay, I'm done. You guys are good? Okay. Who needs that assignment? Why don't I just print them all once? Does everybody need one? Okay. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. So I'll print eight.